In the vast majority, if not all, the videos about Layer 2 protocols, we reiterated that there are three things that you need to focus on. Media access control, data delineation, and error control. We've looked at error control, we've looked at data delineation, so what we have left is media access control or contention control. We briefly mentioned an example or two of contention control when we talked about master-slave setups. Those are typical in, in contexts where you have a mainframe talking to terminals or where the parties are unequal. In most current networks, you have computers that are networked to computers. Um, more specifically, uh, over the last 40 years or more, we've seen computers that are installed on desktops and in offices and so on, and they're all connected to one another and somehow share a medium. They're very often on the same local area network. And somehow they have to, amongst themselves, decide who is allowed to speak and who is not allowed to speak. So this is a community of equals, computers, and you typically do not want to have a central point of failure. Uh, if you had something that said, okay, computer A, now it's your turn, computer B, now it's your turn, then there is a single point of failure. You want to avoid that. So develop, or protocols were developed to facilitate these equals to work without a central point of failure. And there are two primary examples that we need to look at. And the one is the multiple access category of protocols. That is a category of protocols where every station is basically allowed to speak whenever it wants, subject to a couple of rules that have been introduced to lessen the wastage of the medium, to make sure that uh, stations are not sending at the same time, and uh, which would mean that nobody is really sending. The other category is where you have a token, a special token, and whoever has that token is allowed to communicate. In this video, we will look at the multiple access category of protocols, and the next video will deal with the token-based protocols. Our first example of a multiple access protocol is the ALOA protocol developed at the University of Hawaii. Now, this was a protocol that was used between uh, machines that were linked by radio waves. So you had antennas and these props are my two antennas and we've got multiple other antennas around here if you just use your imagination. So the protocol accesses the medium, the air around us, whenever it wants to. So if this one wants to speak, then it just starts speaking. And everyone else will hear and record the message. And similarly, if this one wants to speak, he just starts speaking and everyone gets the message. Uh, nice equal access, whoever can talk, can talk. But... The problem is obviously, suppose this one is talking, and while this one is talking, the other one decides it's time for me to start, to also start talking, then oh, nobody's hearing anything, message is lost. This one may have been done 90% with its message, and then suddenly this one interrupted. So um, yeah, there were solutions. Uh, Slot the lower as an example of a solution, but that's not good enough. We have to find something better. Man, this lockdown is getting to me.
From our earlier illustration, there was one item that may have created the wrong impression. Hopefully you saw that I got very nervous when I noticed this other station that was also listening and that was a possible contender to use the medium. Uh, the only way in which stations can communicate is via the bus. When I saw this contender, I used out-of-band communication. In other words, it means there was a second mechanism to communicate, a visual mechanism. Uh, so in the real life, two computers, three computers, whatever, that are connected to a bus will not know anything about the other nodes. They will only know what is on the wire. There's no way in which they will be able to read the intention of other machines. So the Haloa protocol was a multiple access protocol. Anyone could talk at any moment. And as we said, the problem with that was that if two stations overlapped with their messages, then they could mess up both messages. So the solution to that, the carrier sense option, carrier sense, and uh, what that means is you are looking for a carrier signal. What we've just done is we just check to see whether there was a signal on the wire using an external tool. And in fact, that's a signal tracer. You would use it to identify a cable that runs through a building. We will use it for its real purpose in a later video. Normally, the carrier sheen spot works quite well. Because when you hear that the medium is empty, that there's no carrier signal on it, then uh, chances are that you will be able to start to transmit. The only real problem is in that almost impossible uh, possibility that two stations want to talk exactly at the same moment or as you saw in the previous illustration, that the one station may be waiting and then another station may start waiting and then multiple stations may start waiting and when the medium becomes empty, they all jump onto the medium and suddenly you have a collision and the data is sent together over the same medium and it's just nonsense, it's not understandable at all. So we, we need to solve that. That's our next challenge. But before we introduce new technology, let's just bring in uh, some terminology for what you've just seen. What you saw in the previous example was an illustration of persistent CSMA. So while the medium was busy, I waited. I persisted. Clearly... This is part of the problem because everybody else also persisted and we jumped on the me onto the medium at the same time. So there are two ways out of this. The one is to use non-persistent. Now with non-persistent, you will go back or you will check the medium. If it's busy, you will go and do something, play cards, okay, computers don't really play cards, but uh, carry on with other processes, or just wait a random period of time. And then you come back again, if the medium is empty, then you can transmit. If the medium is not empty, you go back again. You, you, you can see that you can have an infinite wait there, that you may never get a chance to transmit. Uh, but at the very least, we will not cause collisions because we are waiting. Another option is to use what is known as P-persistent. P-persistent is where the P is some probability. So let's say it's 50%. What 50% means, I can flip a coin heads or tails. And if I get my wish... 
uh, then I sort of win. So what I will do is when I arrive at the medium and the medium is busy, then I will wait, I will persist. And then when the medium becomes empty, I flip that coin. And then if I get whatever I want to get heads, then I proceed and I start to transmit the signal. If I get, um, if, I, if I don't get my wish, then I go away for a random period and I come back and I try again. Now, suppose that there are two stations that want to transmit at the same time. They're both waiting, they're both persisting, and uh, you, let's, let's call them A and B, and they both use 50% or 0.5 persistent uh, CSMA. There are four possible outcomes. It's possible that A may say, it is my turn, and B may say, no, it's not my turn. And then you get a message through. Or it's possible that B may say, it's my turn, and A may say, it's not my turn, and you get a message through. It's possible that both A and B will say, it's my turn, and then you get that collision. And that time slot or whatever is wasted. Or um, you uh, can get the possible, it's also possible, that both of them say, I'm going to wait. And then that opportunity to transmit data is wasted. So what we have here are four outcomes, all of them equally likely. And you can see with two out of the four, that one and that one, we have a successful outcome. We transmit data. With the other two, uh, we don't have a successful outcome. Uh, the slot is wasted. That next opportunity to send something on the wire is wasted. Uh, it's pure coincidence that uh, we got a 50% success rate here. What you should do is, let's say we have 0.3 persistent and two machines are waiting. What is the likelihood that they will successfully transmit? Or if we have 0.5 persistent and um, there are three stations that are waiting on the medium, all three waiting for an opportunity, and then they make their choice, their random choice, whether they're going to use the opportunity or not. Go and play with those. Let's leave the theatrics and get back to some proper teaching. We started by discussing the lower protocol where we said that multiple access was one option. Problem that we experienced, uh, stations transmitted while others were busy transmitting, you big mess. We added the carrier chains uh, to that. And uh, that enabled us to listen to decide whether the medium was in use, and if it was in use, we did not transmit. However, when we uh, were ready to transmit, uh, or when the medium became quiet, we started transmitting. It may work very well, but you also saw what happened or could happen. The fact that multiple stations could be waiting, and then suddenly they all start transmitting. And, and you still have a collision. Uh, let's look at that again as a reminder. <laughs> what we were reminded about just now was the fact that when I transmitted while someone else was transmitting, it caused a collision. And uh, that meant that uh, the data message was lost. So we need to add some way of detecting such collisions. At the very least, I want to know, if I'm colliding with anyone else, that I should stop transmitting, that I should stop uh, wasting my effort, uh, rather go away from the medium so that it becomes available again. 
so the protocol that we are uh, developing right now is the one that is known as CSMA slash CD. So it's CSMA and the slash CD says this is with collision detection. I will know when I am involved in a collision. Everybody will be will know that uh, I'm involved in a collision. So um, okay, maybe we should in fact uh, illustrate this. So here I have my transmitter again. I can send data across the bus. And I'm going to listen again to see whether anyone is transmitting. And uh, right now, uh, I am uh, transmitting. I am actually listening. And then, uh, ah, there's someone on the bus. Okay, um, that is wrong. I've just been eavesdropping on a conversation that wasn't intended for me. Uh, I should not hear what is being said. I should just listen to what is being said to me. Now, as an aside, uh, you can set your network interface into promiscuous mode, and then it will hear what is being said on the bus. That's it exactly what Wireshark does. It sets your wire, your network interface to promiscuous mode and while it is in promiscuous mode it will hear the content that is being transmitted. So what I should rather just be able to hear and this is the way that the cart will work in the normal way is that while I'm listening um, it is in fact uh, just telling me whether I am with this data on the network or not. If I'm receiving, yes, then I will be receiving the data. I don't know at this stage whether anyone else is watching or listening. Who knows? Uh, in, in fact, what this protocol now does, the CSMS slash CD, is everybody should be listening. And at this stage, I hear that the medium is empty and I start to transmit. But oops, I hear that I'm in a collision. And if there's anyone else listening, they also hear that I'm in a collision. And what happens now is everybody starts to transmit. So what you hear on this medium is more or less the following. To emphasize, the protocol that we've just developed is the CSMA CD protocol. Carrier sends multiple access with collision detection. This is more or less the pinnacle of this development process. And to a large extent, uh, this is uh, what is being used on current networks with a couple of exceptions and a couple of provisors that we have to talk about. In order to successfully detect a collision, the station that is involved in that collision should still be transmitting when the collision is noted. So what this means is a collision may only be noted once a message has traveled at the speed of electricity, so it's not a long time, but that once that message has traveled to the furthest possible point on that bus, now, uh, uh, this means a packet or a frame has to have a minimum length so that we are sure that if it's involved in a collision, the fact that it is involved in that collision will be reported or will be noticed while it is still busy transmitting data. And you may recall that uh, Ethernet has a minimum payload size of 46 and that's why that minimum is there if the minimum were any shorter than 46 it would have been possible to transmit uh, data and then see that there's a collision but not know that it is your packet that was involved in that collision earlier we noted that the csma cd protocol ethernet is intended to be used on a bus topology and uh, 
in the early EC, a bus would literally have been a cable that everybody connected to. However, the years, the physical manner in which the machines connect have changed. At some point, the notion of a hub was developed, and the hub was, in essence, a point where everything got together. So you would have a cable running from your computer to the hub, but uh, it still was a bus in the sense that whatever you uh, sent to that uh, hub, would be broadcast to everybody else. Now, broadcast in the sense that it would appear on everybody else's media, but um, they would ignore it if it was not addressed to them. Beyond that, so after that, the notion of a switch was developed, and all Ethernet installations nowadays use a switch. If you look at the picture that is uh, displayed now, you may recognize it as the hardware that you see during the introductory uh, section of all these videos. And just to uh, set the scene, what you see at the top is a KVM switch, that is a keyboard video monitor switch. So all the computers that are in that network cabinet are connected to that keyboard video monitor switch and at the bottom of the picture you can see the keyboard and you can see the monitor uh, flat screen and uh, this enables me to talk to any of those computers to to just push a button and get another computer's display up on that screen generally these are network servers so I am not working on them unless uh, something needs to be changed or configured. Uh, in general, I will access the service via the network. At the back of the, that uh, sliding shelf on which you can see this, uh, the screen and the keyboard, you can see one of the Raspberry Pis. And just above that, you can see the computer sticks that we've used in a couple of the videos before. A word about the dimensions of this cabinet, like any other such cabinet, it is 19 inches wide, so this is standard 19 inch cabinet. It's the KVM switch uh, uses what is known as one unit, so it's a one U switch. If you look at the computer sticks at the bottom just above the screen, that is double the size. So that computer is built into a 2U chassis. It's a pretty small size for a computer. You do get some 1U computers, but most computers will be bigger than uh, 2U. So it's a, uh, that's a compact build. Just above uh, sticks, you will see the switches. And those are the things that we really want to talk about now. Uh, before we talk about them, though, let's quickly just mention that above that you can see a so-called brush panel and the cables are coming through it. It's just a nice way of organizing cables. What you are seeing in terms of the switch or switches, there are two switches sitting next to one another there. And the one on the right hand side is just a normal switch. It's a one gigabit uh, per second switch. And on the left hand side is a one gigabit per second switch uh, with PoE. That's power over Ethernet. So it can power the devices that are plugged into it. The switch works more or less like a hub in the sense that from every computer you have a cable running to the switch, whichever switch you are using, and those two switches are interconnected as well. The switch will inspect the packet that is incoming. It will look at the destination address of that packet. The destination computer may also be plugged into that switch, or it may be plugged into a router. In, in uh, whatever is the case, the, uh, the next hop will be plugged into that switch and the switch will send out the message on the cable that goes to the next hop. So unlike the typical broadcast mechanism, the data will only be sent out on a single wire. 
So it is quite possible that on a switch, machine one, or a machine plugged into port one, can be talking to a machine plugged into a port two socket. And at the very same time, a machine plugged into, let's say, port seven, can be talking to a machine plugged into, let's say, port three of that switch. And those conversations can go on simultaneously. So the notion of a collision becomes much, much different. In fact, uh, you will typically send a message to the switch and the switch will then forward it. And rarely will it be the case that the switch cannot forward it immediately. Think about a broadcast situation, for example, where you are really broadcasting to all the nodes. You are using the, the address FFFF and so on on the MAC level. And in that case, the switch has to send out the message to all the other connected uh, devices. So in general, it will buffer it, but uh, if it can't, then you may still get a collision. So hopefully, uh, seeing this picture gives you a, a better feeling of what the real equipment looks like. Um, the, this is what you would see in a typical installation nowadays. Um, I've used some props to, to illustrate how things work, but when you are beginning to think about uh, real-world uh, hardware, this is what it looks like. Uh, remark also for that switch to decide whether something has to go out on a certain cable. It has to inspect the, the packet on layer 2. It has to look at the destination layer or the destination address of that packet or rather of that frame. Therefore, even though this is hardware, it does inspection on layer two. In fact, some switches will even consider layer three. So that uh, pollination or cross-contamination between layers is not only happening, but it often helps to speed up these devices. For logical purposes, we will keep on discussing them as uh, different layers, physical layer and the data link layer and the routing layer and so on, network layer. And, and uh, we will think about that logically. Keep in the back of your mind that in the real world, it's not always that clear cut. Now there development from the CSMA CD protocols is the carrier sends multiple access with collision avoidance. The intent there is to avoid collisions rather than just to notice it. Um, they, those protocols are indeed used, but the ones that are probably more important for us uh, in this collision avoidance category are those that uh, do not sense the carrier. You can think about various scenarios. Think about satellites that orbit the Earth and Earth stations that are talking to that satellite. Now, it's very hard for any Earth station to monitor whether a station somewhere else on Earth is talking to the satellite or not. So it just uh, can't sense the carrier. So uh, what we have are two variants uh, of these protocols uh, that do not do the carrier sensing, uh, MACA and MACOR. And we're just going to very briefly introduce them. With MACA, we address the following sort of problem. For any given node, now here we're beginning to think about stations that are distributed uh, through space and uh, they are typically wireless, not necessarily, uh, but typically wireless. Uh, each will have a radius, so that station may, for example, be able to send and uh, listen within that radius. That node may be able to send and listen within that radius. And your problem now is if a station, let's say uh, that station, wants to talk to that station, 
then it will uh, be able to to see what's going on with that station, uh, whether that station is busy transmitting to it or not. But it is possible that uh, a station may not know that there's communication going on. So as, as a further example, suppose that this station wants to communicate with that station. However, this station is busy transmitting data, and this station here is much too far away from that station. So this station is hidden from that station. So it's the hidden station problem. Uh, and this one is busy transmitting data. And this one tries to listen to the best of its ability within its radius. But this station, let's call it A, is hidden. It doesn't see the transmission going on. And this one starts transmitting and we have a collision. Now the way in which that is solved is by using special packets that are known as clear to send or request to send and clear to send packets. So what you will have is uh, a station that wants to transmit will send a request, request to send packet. And it will send that request to a station that... Um, it wants to talk to. So let's say we have this somewhat simpler layout here. There is a station, there is another station, and there is another station. Those stations can talk to one another. They are quite able to talk to one another. But as far as that station is considered, this station is hidden. So let's make them A, B, and C. So C and B are hidden in respect of one another. Uh, C is hidden from B, B is hidden simply because they are too far away. Uh, and if the one signals, then the other one can't see. But A and C are quite able to communicate. So what you will do here is suppose initially that everything is quiet and a wants to send data to A, or so C wants to send data to A. What C will do is it will send a request to send, just a short message. So if it collides with something, then um, no harm really done because it's a very short packet. It says, A, I want to talk to you and I want to send you a thousand bytes or a million bytes or whatever. And uh, now, when C asks this question, B doesn't hear it because B is outside, it's beyond the range of C. But A then says, okay, that's fine, you can send me, you are clear to send the data to me. And when it says you are clear to send, it says you can send the thousand bytes or the million bytes that you want to send. And when A says that, B overhears that. And because B overhears it, uh, B knows that some station that it can't even see got permission from A to send a thousand bytes or a million bytes, and B then knows not to interfere. So um, it, even though it didn't see the request from C coming through, it saw the response, and therefore it knows how long it should not try to communicate with A because uh, A is already busy, A has given a clear to send message to someone else to proceed. There is another example of the hidden station problem that deserves attention. Suppose we have four stations, let's call that one A, call that one B, and this one is C and D. And uh, it happens for whatever reason uh, that those two stations are able to talk to one another, those two are able to talk to one another, those two are to, uh, uh, able to talk to one another, and those two are able to talk to one another. So uh, up and down they're able to talk to one another, and across they're able to talk to one another, but diagonally they are just too far away. 
Now, what Maka will do, let's say C wants to talk to A. So, it will send a request to send to A. And uh, station D will know about this request to send. So, it knows that maybe uh, C will be able to communicate with A. And then, uh, but, but, but it's not sure. Because that request to send may collide with something. When A sends the, uh, just as an aside, at this stage B knows nothing. Uh, he doesn't know that uh, there is this communication that may happen. When A sends the clear to send, then B knows that there is indeed going to be communication. And recall that for both the request to send and the clear to send, it is specified how much data will be sent. So B will know how long it should remain silent. D will know how long it should, be re it should remain silent. But only if uh, this uh, clear to send acknowledgement is actually sent. If uh, it's never sent, if A is not ready to receive communication, then it will not send it, and then D will remain quiet, and it's not necessary. So this is where we have, with Mecca, both of these stations that are not involved will know about the request in the case of D, and it will know about the permission in the case of B. What uh, is really necessary is something to tell D that this request to send was indeed granted. And the way in which that is handled in a protocol that has the name McCall. So it is multiple access with collision avoidance for wireless. Uh, no carrier sensing going on, uh, but uh, the multiple access anyone can send collision avoidance in the sense of we are sending short little messages about data that is about to be sent so that others can remain silent during that uh, period. And then in particular for wireless so that it solves this hidden station problem that uh, typically occurs in the wireless con uh, context. So what happens here is the request to send is uh, initially sent, then the clear to send the permission is granted and then C sends out a message that is called DS. So a little bit of a space problem, data send. So what the data send is, again, a very short message, and it says basically, thank you, A, I'm going to send this data. So it, it, uh, by doing that, it tells D that permission has indeed been granted. And because permission has been granted, D knows that it has to remain silent. If D says the, sees the request, we know it will not see the acknowledgement, the clear to send. Um, at that stage, it's a tentative thing. Uh, C has asked, but we don't know about it. Uh, but when uh, D sees this data sent, it knows, okay, permission has been granted, I cannot talk now because within my uh, radius, within my area of reception, there is communication going on. I cannot uh, grab the medium now and start transmitting. In this video, we explored multiple access as a media access control mechanism or as a contention control mechanism. Same thing. The multiple access uh, grew from one where the stations were supposed to be not very busy, so you could talk at any point, to a situation where uh, stations potentially became busier and you had to sense the carrier, and uh, then to, to improve its quality, uh, collision uh, detection was added uh, that enabled a station that was involved in a collision 
to just retransmit its data a little bit later and that whole slot for sending data and slot used in quotes because it's not a fixed period that uh, time that followed the initiation or initial sending of the data was not wasted the collision would normally waste uh, such bandwidth uh, from there we move to the situation where the medium is not sensible, you cannot sense it uh, because of things like the hidden station problem, a station that is not within reach of a sender. Um, and we arrived at protocols like Mecca and Macaw. Macaw is indeed used in Wi-Fi, so it is something that most of you use every day. These multiple access protocols are nice in the sense that they don't need any central control. There's no party that needs to oversee anything. Even the switches that we talked about are not intelligent in the way that they manage network communication. Um, yes, they can do a little bit of management, but uh, not who can talk and who cannot talk. All of that is decentralized. For a long time it was assumed that as networks became busier and busier at some point uh, it would become too much of a burden stations would be waiting for so long to get a chance to get to the medium so that, that it would simply fail that we needed something better something where you are guaranteed a time to send and we will see something along those lines in the video on token ring where you do have a sort of a central party, but that in quotes, uh, as we will discover soon. However, uh, history has told us that we can add more and more and more to our networks. As you are aware, uh, people are using Wi-Fi every day, people are using Ethernet every day. We've gone from slow character-based communication to multimedia communication where lots of people are streaming very rich data and th through that evolution we haven't run into problems where this multiple access notion almost democratic notion has failed so we we've gained uh, trust in it we know it will work some technological developments such as the development of the switches did help because it means it's no longer really a single bus, a single piece of cable, and you've got to get onto that, uh, because with switches, multiple stations can be communicating at the same time. It, it alleviates the problem, but uh, even without that, we have just seen Ethernet and its associated protocols as uh, an unexpected success story. In the next video, we will look at Token Ring. You will see that it is a very nice, organized, managed protocol that you are, to a large extent, guaranteed access, or at the very least, you can set up the network in a way where you will be guaranteed access to the network. Um, it, it seemed like the better option, but it died. It's no longer in use. It's still a nice protocol to talk about, because as academics we need to know about the options that exist and that's what we will do discuss the option of using a token on a ring or even on a bus in the next video uh, just before i forget this is non-alcoholic because i'm not supposed to be drinking during uh, lockdown